So tonight is the uh, the fifth night of this uh, terrific week, the eleventh week of uh, showcasing more work from uh, Ukraine. I, I cannot thank the um, the photojournalist for all they do, and and, and thanking all of you, all of you for uh, for coming in. Really appreciate that. Um, and I uh, pre-recorded with uh, Heathcliff O'Malley earlier last week because he was traveling. So um, Jay, cue it in. And off we go. So, um, so after getting to Kiev, we headed straight down to Kherson. I was working with uh, our chief foreign correspondent, Roland Oliphant, and there had just been some very nasty missile strikes on Kherson by the Russians, and 23 were killed and 46 wounded. And they struck the railway station, a supermarket, residential buildings. It was really, really nasty. And I think it's probably the biggest single loss of life in a day in Kherson since the liberation. And we went down. We were going down because we'd heard that there was they were going to lock down Kherson for some sort of counter saboteur operation. So we thought we'd go down and, and you know, have a look before they close the city down. So we're talking about closing the city for three days. Wow. And what happened was the, the morgues released the bodies back to the families so that they could bury them before the city was locked down. So there was this huge rush and all of these families turned up at the morgue and it's you know it's the usual thing of you know it's quite awkward because you you turn up there and you're trying to be sensitive and speak to people and ask if you can you know, tell them who you are and why you're there and ask if you can follow them and fortunately a couple of families agreed and we followed them to the local geologist cemetery which is on a hill overlooking Kersal yeah. yeah. and you know all the time we're there there's the, the sound of artillery never really stops so you know outside the morgue and then as we get to the cemetery you can just hear the constant sound of artillery going but it seemed like on that particular day there was some kind of intense battle going on in the in the estuary of the Dnipro because when you think you've got the Russians on one side of the river so they're about 500 the river's about 500 meters wide there and you've got the Russians on one side Ukrainians on the other then you've got this kind of delta of small islands and the Ukrainians and the Russians at that point were fighting over these islands. Mm. So you had all, all of this going on. And um, so there, there were these two families. And the first one was the mother was Larissa Vedotkina, and she was burying her 31 year old son, Andre who was an engineer and he'd been replacing the, well, trying to repair all of the energy infrastructure. So he was working with a few other engineers and one of these strikes hit where they were working. And you've probably seen before with, with funerals, it's, it's the tradition to have an open, open casket, but clearly he was just so badly injured that they just couldn't do that. And it was, you know, it was really terrible, you know, awful for them having to go through this. And, and Heathcliff, when, when other people see the closed caskets like this, they recognize that that, that boy has been hurt very, very badly. Like it, it's on. I, 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 I would assume so. Yeah. They must, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, it's an assumption, but, they, they always, from my experience, try so hard to have an open casket if they can. But yeah. the only real explanation would be that. Yeah. Because it's, you know, a tradition to to pay their respects before the lid is put on the casket, and they weren't able to do that. So, you know, af after mourning over the casket, the casket was taken over by the staff from the from the um, cemetery, they're essentially the grave diggers. And it was just so quick, you know, there was no priest. It was just quick. And within moments, he was being buried. 
I mean, it was just so fast. And as he was being buried, another hearse was showing up with another family. And within minutes, we had another family ready to to bury to bury their loved ones too. So with the second family, and it was Nadia Lazinka burying her son, Serhi. So Serhi had gone to pick up his wife and daughter from the supermarket. And when the shells came in, it essentially took off the top of his head whilst he was driving. And the car carried on with him dead at the wheel and his wife trying to stop the car and a daughter in the back seat. And yeah, just just awful, really. There were so many. I mean, it's I don't know. Everyone has a different way of working, but there were literally. I I, I photographed two of these funerals. There were so many, so many people coming in, and I just, for me, I, I just felt it was inappropriate to then to start wandering up to other families who had never met me before. But it was this literal. It was, it, it was industrial. You know, I was just going to say, it sounds, it feels like a factory line. Yeah, it was, and 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 that was that was really difficult to see. It, yeah, just really not what you you expect, you know. And because you have the same grave diggers behind you there, who just yeah. it appears those are the same guys, right? Yeah, who just go. From so this one is this is the the picture they used in the paper the the next day which I, I was you know you're never happy to take photographs like this but i'm glad that they used a picture as strong as this because it you know to try mm. and do justice to the to the to the struggle and the and the grief you know this constant grief that ukrainian people are going through you know and Kherson is you know as i told you before i was there when Kherson was liberated and those you know those euphoric first days when you know was there when Zelensky arrived and did his tour and and then saw it slowly descend into into violence I mean it's just yeah so so very sad yeah 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 and, and right. you know on just behind these crosses there's another family and and they were you know wailing really loudly whilst this funeral was going on and yeah just awful and you can see there's just a constant line more and more and they were literally being buried right next to each other the holes were pre-dug and as one family left another family had come in and then you know their loved one would be buried right next to the the previous one not like when you go to a, a cemetery in new york or in london and you have a plot chosen you know this was yeah. get them in but get them in quick yeah, and everyone's respectful of everyone else's space. Oh right? yeah, 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 totally. We'll wait. But, everyone just waits. Mm, yeah, just waiting in line, you know. Mm. Just yeah, horrific. So after Kursov, we we did go up to the Bereslav front line, which is opposite Nova Kokovka, but there wasn't a lot to shoot there. It was like a ghost town, very very tense. It was one of those days where, you know, it had been hit a lot by fast air by Russian jets, but on that day, so there wasn't a lot to see. So we kind of drove through and I'm not going to show you those pictures. It was literally shooting out of the car window. You know, it was like, don't hang around, but we're here. We thought it was going to be bad, but it was just that sort of dangerously quiet. But we went from there, we went to Zaporizhia and, and to Orykiv. And Orykiv, up until recently, was the sort of Zaporizhia front line. So it's from Orykiv where that southern push has been recently during the counteroffensive where they've managed to Good morning, do several kilometres south of there. But the story we went to do before this counteroffensive started was about a local paper that had been running for years in the village since since the um, Soviet times called Trutova Slava, which means glory of labour. Hmm. And in this picture, you can see Vladimir Chenenko. He's a 74-year-old former photographer for the newspaper who stayed in the who stayed in the town. the The paper now is only a few pages, and it's printed back in Zaporizhia. But it's you know you're, they're they're in a town where 
there's very little mobile reception you know you don't have cable tv and everything it's kind of like it's a lifeline for the the people that stay and especially a lot of the people that stay are are elderly who you know the print media is still something really important to them and they got picked up a lot by the local ukrainian press this story as well but vladimir took us around the old newspaper offices which are now derelict in in orikiv it was one of those days again it was you know it's like oh you know if you'd been here a few hours ago, it was you know so much shelling and you know the Russian jets were over and then we seem to keep hitting places at a quiet time, which was which was nice because it's very unpleasant when things get noisy. So yeah, this is the old dark room in in the offices. Bits of chemicals out. There's a an enlarger up against the wall and. There's Vladimir just looking at one of his old negatives. Looks like, I don't know, medium format negative or something. It's like going back in time here, huh? Yeah, 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 totally. You know, and, and for him, it's, you know, this was his life for so many years. And, you know, old copies of the paper on the floor outside the entrance. And I mean, there's literally nobody around. I mean, this was a military vehicle that just seemed to be driving around the perimeter. And when we parked up nearby them, they kind of waved at us and just said, no, you know, don't come over and speak to us or take any pictures or anything. But it was, you know, in, in these kind of places on the front, you you park under you park under trees, right? Because of drones. Mm -hmm. So when we when we next saw that vehicle, it was parked under a tree in the in the in the city center. We we always, yeah, we had to hide our car when we when we pulled over, and yeah, so it was just a nice little story. The 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 Ukrainian journalist union picked it up, and it's nice to do those little sort of human interest stories, you know, and how this a simple thing like printing a six page newspaper, you know once a month or whatever is means a lot and they also they had a they had a bus that came in as well and oh here's just these guys were moving wood from trees that have been hit during a strike there's a huge crater behind him and they're just kind of clearing up the road again it, and it, you know, you it's, always, it's, just, always, yeah. it, it's always <laughs> intriguing when you see the photographs how to, to maintain some type of normalcy to get these things off the street, you know, so, yeah, it's crazy. so vehicles can move. So the milkman can yeah. get them. it's, it's, and, and kept clean. It's mm. uh, yeah, totally. I mean, they've, you know, I mean, the, the road looks like it's been swept and it probably has, and you see that everywhere, but even in, you know, in a city that's pretty much deserted and there's hardly anybody left the the few people that are there still trying to, keep some dignity and a sense of community you know yeah it's um yeah you took the word right out of my mouth it was, it, it's a real dignity um yeah that, that they have it's incredible and then after Orokiv, we went over to the donbass and we wanted to just see what was going on towards the front and we got offered a facility with the air defense, so it was the ATF Air Assault Brigade. And their artillery sits a little bit further back from what they call the zero line. And ahead of the artillery, they have air defense units who are there to protect them against you know, fighter jets, helicopters, and increasingly drones. So we were invited along to you know to see what they they were doing, and it was, it was, the morning after this renewed counteroffensive against Bakhmut. So on the night of the tenth of May, the the kind of revitalized as of um, I can't remember they called that the third assault brigade or whatever they were renamed at that point I think had gone in and pushed the Russians back from the western side of Bakhmut so we got there the next morning and 
I mean, neither me or Roland, who has done a lot more frontline stuff in Ukraine than I have over the years, were really quite shocked at how noisy it was. I mean, if I'd been doing video, I mean, it was it was just crazy. There was so much incoming and outgoing. And as we were, you know, driving along in one of their, they wouldn't let us take our own vehicle. We had to go in one of their vehicles. And as we were driving along, it was just there was artillery just going off everywhere and artillery coming in. And it was just one of those very noisy times. And this is just a shot of a BMP coming towards us. Um, and I just shot over the driver's shoulder through the windscreen as we were heading out. And um, we ended up in this tree line kind of kind of north of Chaziv Yar and just west of Bakhmut. Yeah, Heathcliff, can you share how you deal with that tension? You're there for a month, and it's all tension-driven for that period of time. I mean, the soldiers are doing this month after month after month, you know, and that's, I guess, their job. But yeah. like, how do you deal with it, you know, from a standpoint of, as we spoke before, you know, you're doing this for a solid month, and you're really in a constant state of nervousness. How do you deal with that? Do you know what? I don't know. It's funny. This time I I took my Garmin watch with me just to measure my resting heartbeat. Mm. <laughs> it might seem a bit weird, but I know what no. my, my, my resting heartbeat's normally really, really low. I'm like at the very, very, I mean, I should be an athlete really, but clearly I'm not. But, you know. So I've got a very low heart rate. And during my month, there this time it was 10 beats faster by resting my, my resting rate than it normally is which i guess you know I, I just thought it'd be interesting to see if it was any different and it is so you are in this kind of constant state of anxiety i guess i mean you don't really try and analyze it too much when you're there it's you know when you're getting in the vehicle because you never know what they're going to offer you right so yeah. they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll take you to the air defense. You can speak to some people. We had no idea where we were going to go. And then the next thing you know, we're we're heading up to, you know, not the zero line, but, you know, you're well within getting whacked by something. And it's, yeah, I don't know. You, you just deal with it. Yeah. And, you know, I guess you're keeping yourself busy anyway. You're working. So that kind of takes your mind off it. But I think that the worst moment is when you're just driving there. And you're just sitting there crammed in the back. You've got your body, your armor on. And, you know, for me, my cameras are on my lap or I'm trying to take a picture out the window or whatever. And you've got no idea where you're going because they don't tell you where, where they're taking you. Mm. And, you know, you're, you're driving through and then you're going over fields and getting stuck in the mud and, mm. you know, and yeah, yeah. And you're looking out and hope, you know, is it cloudy enough today? Are we going to have some cover from the, you know, it's all of that all that's going on but uh, it's it was it was fine and yeah ultimately but yeah very very noisy and this guy um Mikhailo was one of the senior ncos there who sort of took us around we didn't get to see a huge amount it was you know there was there was clearly some artillery very very close by but we didn't get invited to have a look at too but you you take what you get on the day you know yeah and um it's one of the younger soldiers just looking up out out from the trees because they're they're always wondering what's out there are the are the drones going to come in because now what you have are these they'll have like a one of these quad rotor drones the russians will use like a, a quad rotor drone as a spotter and then they'll have a loitering drone which will have a warhead on it and they're like a kind of kamikaze drone the ukrainians use them as well but so they'll 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 have a drone flying around looking, and if they see anything, then the other one will come in and just. So they're always on the lookout, and they have these um, tracked. This is one of the vehicles. I mean, it was yeah you know, hidden by the foliage. I mean, there was yeah not really much point in trying to take a wide shot of the thing. It was pretty well covered up. But they, this is one of these anti-aircraft. Um, is it called a a trailer? I think sort of old soviet radar assisted anti-aircraft thing 
and then some handheld weapons as well. And yeah, so that, that was interesting just to go and have a look and but you can help thinking, you know, here we, we're all waiting at that point for the counteroffensive to start. And yet again, it's it's Bakhmut. <laughs> it always seems to, you know, why is it Bakhmut again? You know, it's like, and it's still the same thing now. They're still, in, instead of concentrating, anyway, I'm not going to, you know, they, they know what they're doing. But it did seem odd at the time that it was Bakhmut again when everyone was expecting a push in the south and, you know, all of this material is going into Bakhmut. So after that, we headed straight back to Dnipro. So we literally, we could have stayed another night in Pokrovsk. We were in the, in the hotel that was hit recently. You know, we'd had pizza in the pizzeria and Pokrovsk, spent the night in Pokrovsk the night before. And um, yeah, just a few weeks ago, that, that hotel was hit and the pizzeria was hit. And so we'd spent that one night there and it was like, well, do we spend the afternoon whilst Roland writes his story? And or do we just drive back? So I just said, look, let's just drive straight back to Dnipro, you know, from there. I think we got in. Yep. Yeah, and so he could just write in the vehicle and then, you know, have a night in a decent hotel. Yeah. And, and we'll get the story out because we just knew that, yeah, he would spend the next day just writing this. You know, it was. Yeah. And, and speak a little bit about that relationship with you and Roland. Is, do, do you see what he sends out before it goes out? Does he ask you, like, what is that relationship? Not really. I mean, sometimes. Because, you know, I've worked with a number of journalists out there and on any story like this, you know, sometimes you might you know, get a call. Oh, do you remember when we were, you know, here? You know, can you remember that soldier's name or, you know, what was, you know, can you remember what that, you know, was that an eagle that flew past? Or, you know, they might ask me a question like trying to jog their own memory mm. or, you know, can you send me a couple of pictures so that I can, you know, as a reference if they're trying to describe something or whatever. Um, but no, I never... Often when it's sent, a journalist will send me the copy so I can have a look at it as well. Just okay. you know, nice to nice to read it and see what's going to be used. But yeah, it's not like we can't we don't sit together. I mean, it's I just leave them, you know, and I I go off and have a walk or you know go and take some pictures or whatever and let them write and because yeah. it's you know they they've got all of, yeah, yeah they've got to deal with the office calling them and probably trying to get him to write something else at the same time, some other story, you know? So, right. yeah, it's... And, and it's, it's similar to that in, in all publications, you know, where it's sort of um, an equal balance, you know, more or less? Yeah, I think so. It's, you know, I mean, it might be different. You know, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i in my 50s now, so it'd be quite difficult, I think, if it wasn't equal. You know, I've been been around the block enough times to I think when I started when I was in my 20s you, know, you kind of sometimes felt like you were the journalist the journalist Batman which is a term we used to use for you know like the, the guy that used to drive the officers around in in right. World War Two or whatever you know? um, but that's you know when you're when you're a young rookie yeah I guess maybe the relationship's a little bit different but I think things have moved on as well and yeah it's a it's a pretty equal relationship but but as on these kind of trips, there's at least three of you, right? So you also have a fixer, and without the fixer, you're, you know, you wouldn't get anything done. I mean, the fixers are the un, the unsung heroes of all of this, if if hero is the right word. I mean, these are local people who are often journalists themselves. So on this trip, we were working with a woman called Inna, who is also a camera woman and a journalist and has been covering the conflict since 2014 and knows everybody so yeah there if anything it's i would say that the pecking order kind of is fixer and then journalist and photographer below because <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think you know, the fixer is the most important person they you know obviously we know what we want and how it needs to be done but without you know you just couldn't operate without the fixer and you know the knowledge they have and yeah they're 
they're incredible and and it's so important that you don't forget when you go you know that these people they live they live in the country this is their lives just it's not just they're not just working you know this is their life they have to live this every day so when they you know when you get back from a road trip of a few weeks and they get to see their families again and everything this is yeah we, we get to go home they don't get to go they don't get to leave you know they're there every day so yeah amazing respect for them and, so, and does, mm. does the does the military respect them as well as sort of equal partners because what they're doing is helping facilitate getting information out to the rest of the world you know what is that relationship like i think it can be tense at times you know it's a lot of them have good relationships with the military, but I know oh, that yeah. there has been some friction between the local, you know, the Ukrainian journalists and the military as well, because the military are a little bit too restrictive and controlling. And they have favorites, you know, there's all of that that goes on as well. Um, and there was a lot of that during the liberation of Kherson when some people got access and everybody else was you know, kept back or whatever. So, yeah, there is tension. Okay. Yeah. And, but it works, and it's, you know, as we know, it's, this is an existential war, so sometimes you just have to put up with what the, <laughs> what the armed forces want, right. even if, you don't, if it doesn't, even if it doesn't necessarily fit your narrative or gets in the way of your story or whatever, you just have to be patient with them and really understand that, you know, the gravity of what they're doing as well. So yeah, we had a few days in in Dnipro, and whilst Roland was writing, Inner and I just had a walk along the Dnipro River bank, just having a look around. It's I I just like walking about and just seeing people. There were these young Ukrainians under a bridge drinking, and I just thought it was you know just a nice scene, and I just thought oh. I seem to have there was another set of pictures in there which I seem to have misplaced. They might crop up later. But I just got talking to some of them, and what was really interesting was they were just describing their lives during the war. You know, a lot of you know the guy in the white t-shirt in the background. He was acting, and he was in TV, you know, in TV commercials, and had a really good life before the war. And everything stopped. You know, he's looking after his grandmother, his parents have gone to Poland, his friends are in Germany and Austria and Poland and elsewhere. And you've got all of these young people who, I mean, you could say, well, you know, why aren't they in the army or whatever? I'm right? just going to ask you that. You know, <laughs> each of their own. <laughs> Not everybody wants to join up or, you know, one of them did say that they hadn't told their girlfriend yet that they were joining. But they're all stuck in this limbo, like their, their lives have been put on hold. And you can, and I and I felt for them because you could just say, well, you know, this this is war, and you know, toughen up or whatever. But it's it's tough for them. They everything has changed for them. Their whole lives have been uprooted. Almost everybody's gone. They've a lot of them have lost their jobs, and you know, what is there to do? You know, I mean, you see it in. I mean, they're in Dnipro. I mean, you see it in places like Orykiv where, I mean, you know, you're either elderly or, you know, often very, very drunk, you know, the, the people that you see that are left, you know, it's the drunks and the elderly. But here, they, this lot, they weren't drunk. They were just young and having a drink. They were meeting up. They formed a telegram group, which was getting bigger and bigger. And they would just meet up and, and chat and stuff. And I just thought it was quite sweet, just seeing them trying trying to live their lives and deal you know because you, you wonder you know what goes through people's heads and they just you know they just want it all to end as quickly as possible and so they can get on with their lives again you know yeah i mean that whole nation is going to have a mental health issue right oh yeah i mean it's a story i'd, I'd love to do but yeah it's yeah getting I, the, the time and the resources to do it i mean it's you know ukraine is going through immense trauma already and you know once this is over they've got to rebuild the country and they've got to rebuild their lives and they've got to rebuild their minds as well you know yeah. yes it's, I, I mean it, it's interesting because i remember I, I don't know who i i mentioned it to but like those young people 
you know, I assume they're not going to be able to go back to the, you know, the politics side of this. They're not going to be able to go back to all the corruption that was part of the Ukrainian government. Right. I mean, it's got to be a new, fresh start to, you know, to putting this country back together. And, you know, they're not going to be able or, or not going to put up with the way the system was. So it, it'll be interesting to see how mm. that changes or evolves. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's even if this war ends, right? Because we still don't know what's going to happen. I, th I think, you know, there's there's a lot of wishful thinking out there and a, a lot of sort of rose tinted kind of flag waving that goes on with this but you know this war is far from over and we still don't know what the end result is going to be we don't know what will go on with the what will happen to the democracy in to democracy in ukraine i mean we it's it's they just don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. They have no idea, you know, what's going to happen. They, they, they're all hoping that things will turn out the way they want it to and they'll get their country back and things will return to normal. But it's still, you know, it's still all up in the air at the moment. And it's, you know, it's, it's absolutely tragic. Yeah. Right, here we go. So, yeah, here, here this is, I mean, I literally, I, I, I didn't have a portrait, a portrait lens on me, so I, I, just took these with my iPhone on portrait mode, I think. But and I didn't send these to the paper. I I put a few of them on Instagram, just with a few quotes, which I haven't printed out because I thought it might just take a bit long to read out their their thoughts. But this was one of the couples, and um, this was the guy that was an act was acting before the war broke out. Yeah. And, so he yeah. he could how how is it for you to take these types of photographs? in the middle of all of this? Well, I mean, I quite like taking portraits and yeah, it was a quiet, it's, it's, it was a quiet balmy day mm. on the riverbank, you know? it It's kind of difficult to think, but you know, one moment you're on a front line and you can, you know, you've got the sound of the artillery and the, you know, the, the tension and, you know, whatever, you know, the fear and then, Four hours drive, I guess it is from the Donbass back to Dnipro. Four hours later, you you know people are promenading along yeah. the riverbank. That's not to say that there won't be air raid sirens. And I mean, we right. were sitting outside a restaurant one night, and and a missile. There was an air raid, and we you know just thought, right, okay, we hear them all the time. But then there was this enormous whooshing sound, and we all ran into the restaurant. And we found out the next morning that that was the sound of one of the missiles that had just been shot down and it landed and crashed through a roof of an apartment block 150 metres from where we were sitting. And that's the reality of it. And I went into that home and I photographed the, you know, the hole in the roof and this family that had just been, you know, getting ready for bed. And, yeah, so that is the reality of it, you know, that it's... We were talking about extremes, you know, <laughs> and yeah. before, um, and and it's the extremes of of living. And I guess it was the same in London during the Blitz. Yeah. You can think of what life in Paris was like during World War Two. You know, you have these extremes. Right. This kind of juxtaposition between, you know, so only a, a few hours away, and, and and you're just in a completely different world. Oh, it's, it's amazing, really. Yeah. So we, we went back to Kiev. We were having a bit of a, a handover. Uh, Roland was leaving, and my former editor from when I very first started with the Telegraph was coming out to do a few stories, and I agreed to stay behind. And this is just a shot from above Kiev, looking down across the Dnipro again. Beautiful. Yeah. And and then down, this is down by the um, St. Michael's Monastery, and there's a wall of remembrance, which is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day, right? So quite nearby, they have they have all of these Russian tanks and armoured vehicles that sit there on display, some of which I think were put back down onto the main high road recently for the anniversary. But 
there's this enormous wall of remembrance and this is just a I, I didn't speak to this guy I didn't I at that point I was in between fixers and I didn't really want to bother him too much and he was just placing another picture on a wall he was just trying to stick it on the wall as I turned out he had another friend and they had some glue and they were just trying to put up another picture to remember I don't know it could have been a brother or a friend I'm not too sure but it's just this endless cycle of what's going on you know just every day there are you can see these faces and you know this is just one segment of this wall all of these people whose lives were taken away from them for absolutely no reason at all right mm-hmm. but obviously they're yeah you know, they've given their lives to defend their country but they've lost their lives because somebody started a needless war yeah all these and, young faces and, and so many women yeah, yeah yeah a lot of women you know I think the, I think there's something like forty thousand women in the Ukrainian armed forces. Is that right? Yeah, you know, which is about half the size of the UK's armed forces in total. I mean, it's there's a lot of women in the armed forces, and they're increasingly, you know, right up at the very front line. So we started to, we we did a few profiles of charities out. In Ukraine, and this is Arresta Brit, who was a former beauty queen, and she's founder of the Bon B O N N G O and Charity Foundation. So she has two foundations. One is civilian aid, and the other is military aid. Which you know, so military aid kind of sounds odd, but she has like a workshop making drone parts and stuff like that. So you've got one of her guys, I think his code name was 21. I don't know if he liked poker or whatever. I don't know. But he, you can see you've got all of these 3D printed parts for any of these are for dropping grenades from civilian drones. So that's a like a fin that you'd put on the back of a grenade and down at the bottom on the table you can just see the the parts that are used to release grenades so that they're, they're, they're a 3d printing stuff and these are detonators i mean they, they seem so rudimentary i mean they look like little toys my god yeah i know it's crazy right especially with this brightly colored plastic yeah and um so yeah they, they do that and then they 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 have some yeah they provide supplies for civilians as well. Yeah. And, and it's just, there's been a lot of this, these kind of startups, you know, these small charities that are helping the, you know, whether it's the war effort or or just relief for people that are stuck. Yeah. So yeah. They, they had rooms full of, you know, like diapers yeah. and stuff and whatever. You know, between this photograph and the and the one that you have of um, all the portraits on the wall, there's something compelling about those images because they're not the classic military photographs that you see when somebody has passed away. Somebody, no. you know, it's it's like a shot that their mom took, their friend took, you know, all yeah. of that. You know, like when yeah. you look at that, there's personalities to each one of them. You know, mm. and and you know. It, it appears without knowing 85% of these are not, you know, the standard military photograph, right? They're, you know, no. they're compelling images of, of nice people. You know, I, I want to just, you know, say that. You know, yeah. And a lot of them, they, you know, they wouldn't have been regular soldiers either, you know, and some right. of them would have been career soldiers, but many of them would have, you know, work, you know, they might have been a barista or a computer right. programmer or working in a supermarket or but that's what know, it allowed they could have been in a bank. But but that's exactly the point. These yeah. types of photographs allow us to get to know them, even if it's just in our imagination. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like yeah, like you say, there's a barista in there, there's a you know, somebody who works in advertising, you know, mm. or a good little soccer player. Yeah. Yeah. Football player. Yeah. yeah. So um, these two, so we have Kolya and Dima. So they 
both fought for quite a long time, I think since 2014, been you know, fighting against the Russian invasion since, you know, since then. And they were working together as a sniper team last year in the Kherson area, just you know, before Kherson um, was liberated. And they were they were out on you know on another sort of scouting mission and all hell broke loose and you know normally you know with sniper teams their their whole deal is to try and stay you know undercover not be spotted get in and out without anyone realizing you were there and somehow they ended up stuck between their lines and the Russian lines of a very nasty firefight. Both of them suffered pretty nasty head wounds. So they both got bullets to their heads, right? Because they were literally in the middle. And in the end, yeah, both of them managed to crawl back to safety one after the other. So Dima, I think, got hit first and he managed, he started crawling back. Kolya was trying to hold the Russians off. And then, yeah, he got hit too. So they both recuperated, and they are. So here they are on on this on this firing range in Kiev, and they they now teach tactical training instead. I think Dima especially. I think his wounds are just too severe to go back to the front. Oh, pretty substantial damage from the head wound, and it's just yeah, you know, it's just a quick thing. It's just a you know some portraits of the two of them. Just with a you know, kind of dark wall at the side of the the range, and it's just impressive meeting these. You know, when you think everything they'd gone through, and they still want to do whatever they can. You know, they might not really well. Dima, especially, you know, he can't go back and fight again. I mean, I'm sure if he was asked to, he would, but they're still just trying to do what they can. You know, and help any way they can and it, it's it, and, and you know that another obvious thing you know it's a country filled with heroic actions and yeah. heroic feats i mean that you know it, it's like everyone is a hero in one way or another volunteers yeah. everybody's yeah. trying to do their bit so yeah. then we went to see a women's charity called veteranka and they're the Ukrainian women's veteran movement in Kiev. And one of the co-founders is Katerina Primak. And in their offices, one of the things they do is they they make a lot of clothing, especially for women, because a lot of the women, a lot of the, the uniforms are designed to enter only fit men and the fat jackets and stuff. So they've got seamstresses and you know, all sorts of people working together. And it was just another look at, you know, these these small kind of cottage industries, you know, funded by charitable donations, which are helping out. It's not just, you know, big factories and stuff churning out all of the clothing. And, you know, you think, this, you know, winter's coming again, right? So people are going to be needing to make winter uniforms again. So you've got all of this going on and all of these people that are chipping in and helping. It's a bit like at the Hello. beginning of... Hi. Us, you know, saw these amazing scenes of yeah. people sewing, yeah. camouflage knitting, yeah. and singing and stuff. And it's just this how the the whole country has mobilized yeah. to, to make a. You, you, to make you a know, it, it, it's interesting yeah. because like those people working in this small yeah. setting to appreciate the value of what they're doing in the smallest way, right? I mean, it's yeah. not a huge factory. You know, they, they may do a couple of meters of some camouflage or a dress or, or pants or whatever it is, but for them to feel how important that is, is really compelling. That makes them not stop. Yeah, yeah, totally. And 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 you, for them to to carry on, you need you need people like this, right? Yeah, it's it's what it's what keeps society together, and it is amazing. Just when when you're in Ukraine and you realize that that through all of this, that there you know, that there is still a functioning society. Yeah, you know, and yeah, yeah it's it's incredible. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, so a lot of this is it's all charitable stuff. So this is 
so we went to Kharkiv after that, and this is a charity called Siobhan's Trust from Scotland. I don't have to make suffer. And what they do is they've they've had these trucks custom built with pizza ovens. So you can see in the back of that picture are all of these pizza ovens, right? And they literally drive from town to town and they plot up and they set you know set out their wagons it's a bit like you know circling the wagons in the wild west they kind of create this sort of semi protective kind of ring and they serve you know tens of thousands of pizzas to people and it's it was quite incredible i i went spent two days with them and the first was a little village outside Kharkiv, and then we went to Izium, which was liberated this time last year, roughly. Maybe, maybe about 11 months ago, Izium was um, liberated. And you kind of think, oh, it's just pizza, isn't it? You know, and whatever. And it, a lot of them are, you know, a lot of them, they're Scots, and some of them are wearing kilts. And, you know, it's, it's quite a bizarre thing, but. And you, you sometimes hear Ukrainians saying, well, you know, what we want is we can do the aid ourselves. We just want the su the supplies, right? But people genuinely appreciated what they were doing. And when at first I was a bit sort of sceptical, you kind of thought, well, do you know what, what it does for people as well as the food? It's this kind of sense for the Ukrainians that they're not alone. So even though they can distribute aid themselves and do all of this they've got enough people to do this still having people come from other countries and helping it's that little boost like for the Ukrainian people knowing that they're not alone that there are people outside of ukraine that care and support for them and you've got this crazy guy so he's one of the founders david fox pitt and he's doing a little Scottish dance, you know, and there's a back some bagpipes playing in the background. And you, know, you can see this, uh, you know, this woman's got her hand up to her mouth and she's like, what on earth's going on and giggling. And, but it's bringing a smile to their faces and, you know, and some food and whatever. And yeah, then, and just showing that they're not alone. So yeah. yeah. And this yeah. is, this is um, in Isium. So. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a former Miss Ukraine, I believe, who's working with the, with the charity now. And this is in the main square in Izium. All the, the buildings around the main square have been gutted out by, by strikes. And, yeah, just a shot of the truck. Yeah, I mean, to bring a sense of humanity you know, in, in this craziness. Um, yeah. Is wonderful. It really is. You, you can't put a price tag on it. You can't really put the right words to it. It's just no. something you feel in your stomach, right? Yeah. And I think this okay. is the only time I used my drone on this particular trip. It was just to get a sense of yeah. Beautiful. You know, the, the people queuing up and and a bit of the, the square, you know. And, as, and, and the queue was like that all day. Yeah. Just, you know, just didn't stop. They were just... And amazing, really, and you can see there, you know, how they've they've set themselves up. Yeah, and, and you know, typical Ukraine, everything is in order, right? Yeah, yeah, amazing. They, they queue. They like the English like that. They queue. You know, they love to queue. They're very good at it. The slightest hint of something going on. I mean, the, when we arrived, the old babushkas were already. They'd heard something was happening, and they were they were already queuing up before the trucks had got there. Yeah, and and you could see in the background. That building has been bombed out, but they've already made the pile of rubble nice and neat on the side. Oh, yeah, of the yeah, building. totally. And right. you I can't mean, quite see it. To the left of that building is a distribution center that I went to last year where they they hand out clothes and toys and stuff to families. And it's you know, it's been very organized since liberation. It's, yeah, it's staggering. Yeah. And then on the way back, we just visit. There's this huge cemetery on the edge of Kharkiv, and um, I haven't written the name down there. It's you know, all they've got so many cemeteries that they're they're numbered, right? They don't. A lot of them don't have. I mean, there was the one, the geological cemetery and Kherson, but a lot of them just 
just have numbers. And this is Vitaly Lynette. He's 61. He's a former grave digger. And we, we went to speak to him when we got there and asked if we, you know, if it if it was okay for us to just take a look around, just explain what we were up to. And he insisted on taking us. Yeah, you know, he drove us over to the, the the these cemeteries are so huge, and he drove us in his old larder to the part of the cemetery where all of the military graves are. And I mean, it's I can't remember what the figures were now. It was a huge amount, and you could really see there were marble there were the marble gravestones from the kind of twenty fourteen era of the war, mm. and then since then, all of these fresh grave since 20 from february 22 and he insisted on taking us to this one particular grave which is of maxim sherback who's 29 years old and he'd been billeted fairly close to the cemetery i think maybe just on the edge of it and and vitali had got to know him and become quite fond of him and then maxim was sent off to the front line near kupiansk and was killed and yeah he just wanted to to share that story and you know pay his respects and it's yeah just it's a little vignette you know yeah. this is going on you know every day there's uh, probably be another soldier buried yeah and he could so are, are these cemeteries permanent and or, yeah 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 they, they yeah, are permanent, and, and, and they'll be, and I don't know if you would know the answer to this, but they will be sort of, or, not organized, but they'll be made to look beautiful, you know, the, the oh, outside, yeah. right? In, in yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you can see, I mean, some of these already, they have a, like a kind of concrete frame around yeah. them. At some point, they'll, they'll end up with, you know, all of these will end up with marble headstones at some point too. But just right now, it's, I think right. it's just the numbers are too high, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I mean, it's... It's strange. I mean, it's yeah. You know, when you walk in and you're surrounded by all these flags, it's almost it's almost beautiful, you know. And yeah. you're there, and the wind's flapping. You've got all these flags, and, and the you've flowers. got Ukrainian flags. You've got Azov flags. You've got flags which are from airborne brigades. You've got all of these different flags, and you know, there's blue sky. These flags are fluttering, and and it's quite serene. But then you take a moment and you look down and you'll see a picture of a young man or a young woman and it's like well yeah awful just awful so i think this is the final bit so we were working we'd met we knew this other volunteer who'd driven over from britain there's there's a charity that provides pickup trucks and converts them into frontline ambulances mm. so they're not like a true ambulance but they're useful for going up to the zero line and picking up soldiers and getting them out quickly right and um, so we follow them to deliver this pickup truck which i'm not i'm not showing those pictures here but what happened was because of this delivery they invited us to go to what they call a stabilization point which is where wounded soldiers are brought from the front line. So the first, so they, they'll get some immediate treatment from a medic on the zero line. And then as soon as they possibly can, they get taken to a stabilization point where they're checked over by proper medical professionals and a surgeon and patched up or stabilized to then be moved to a proper functioning hospital. So we were north north of um Bakhmut in the Donbass and this first image is just a view I mean it's kind of difficult to see but hopefully you can see that you know across the fields there's just all of this smoke in the distance yep you know from you know some kind of action going on in the distance and this is in one of the kind of treatment rooms, operating rooms, whatever you call it. And there's lots of badges that have been donated by soldiers that have been treated there. And 
kids have made little angels and things and you know it's it's just in a in a house this stabilization point it's, it's just like any other house and when we got there we had to um kind of stay undercover under a like a veranda because of the threat of drones so make sure i've got the right papers here so this is spitlana and she now works as an assistant at the stabilization point but she escaped from mariupol during the russian invasion mm. and um she yeah once she managed to get out of mariupol and went through the the awful you know the awful trauma of you know having to go through the russian lines and go through the filtration system she managed to get back into ukraine proper and and volunteered to work with the army medics. And that's what she's done ever since. You know, she's lost everything and now she volunteers and works. And, you know, does a lot of the sort of the, the, the high, you know, deals with cleaning up afterwards and the hygiene stuff and assists during treatments. And um, in between patients coming in, I guess you'd call them patients between, you know, when it's yeah. during the quiet times, everyone sits around, they smoke a lot, you know, drink tea, talk, look on their phones. And then we've got Yana here, who's actually reading a biography of Churchill, which is just, you know, a, a nice little touch for a British newspaper, you know, yeah. sitting there reading Churchill. Yeah. And, was, and then yeah. We, we, we got a, you know, we got a message coming through saying, you know, there's somebody coming down. We, there, there was one soldier that came prior and, he was coming with a legacy wound, so he had some shrapnel that I guess couldn't be taken out and it was bugging him, so he'd come back in, but he wouldn't be photographed. And you have to be very careful, you know, it's it's their rules. And we got told that somebody else was coming in. And this guy, he was from memory, he was wounded by an anti-tank grenade. So I guess like an RPG or something had been fired at their position. He'd been wounded and his friend or colleague had been killed outright so he was just being brought in so we got like a 20 minutes heads up that there was a vehicle coming and this is a you know proper kind of full-sized ambulance but it's obviously been knocked around a bit but it's you know it's gotten there and they're carrying him in and really? his he's just peppered and it's difficult when you're working in these situations that the ground rules are no faces of the soldiers and don't identify the surgeons because the surgeons, the military surgeons, they're targets. And you have to be very, very careful about identifying them. You know, occasionally you might, you know, see pictures of them, but yeah, every military surgeon I've ever met is just like no photos. Even when we're in a like a hospital in a city, you know, they'll be like, look, we just can't, yeah, we can't go, we can't, we can't even quote our names or anything. And so they're so whilst you're working, you're you're trying to hide faces, you're trying to hide other stuff, right? Because they just strip them down. And this guy was just peppered with shrapnel in his lower body. I guess you know he'd maybe he'd managed to to jump and land and cover, you know, land on his belly, you know, keep low, and then the shrapnel had just come down and peppered his legs and maybe I guess his flak jacket protected his torso, right? So his legs were just peppered and both sides. But, you know, he, he was kind of lucid, but, you know, it was one of those stages where it would have been great to have shown his face. But when somebody's doped up on painkillers, right, and they're in shock, mm. for me to, if I'd said, you know, do you mind if we show your face? It's not really corpus mm. mentis, right? It's, you know. He he can't make a judgment call in a in a situation like that. So you, you just you just work with it and try and do what you can. But it was just this amazing instructor position from one moment they're just sitting there. Know. Yeah, the what the, the medics are all sitting around on their phones, reading books, passing the time, and then suddenly somebody comes in and they just start to work and it's just seamless. And you know, they get the IVs in. You know, for for a little ha 
just consider in a little house they've got a lot of equipment there you know that they need to stabilize and um yeah and they they patched him up and got him back in the ambulance and were taking him back to it wasn't Krematorsk um but yeah they're taking him back to one of the hospitals just a little bit further west for further treatment again well organized um, yeah. functional right yeah yeah so yeah it was a real privilege just to see them at work you know yeah and yeah so and you you, you get volunteers doing it as well you've got the hospitaliers who are like a volunteer organization but now work with the army as well and at some point it'd be you know maybe nice to do something with them but you've so it's not just the military that do the evacs you'll you'll, you'll get volunteer organizations that also assist the military and getting people getting so wounded soldiers away from those stabilization points and back to hospitals i think the hospitaliers actually have like a full bus you know like a coach we would call it like a big right. bus which they've kitted out which will take i think nine or ten wounded service men and women at a time back if they need to yeah hey, yeah he so could that's be. that's you, my that, that was my yeah that was my last trip yeah you, you could stop sharing so um when when do you plan to go back or or what 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 are the plans do you have any you know far out plans of you know what's coming next for you no i i really have no idea at all what's coming next it's okay. And I, I, I just wonder, you know, it's. I guess this autumn things think something will happen this autumn. I, I think it's, it's apart from the flooding. I mean, there's been this you know steady. Drip of, loss of life, you know, and instant, but it's, the story hasn't developed. A great deal, you know, the the counteroffensive has been going on, but it hasn't moved hugely. I mean, it seems like now that they're they might have broken through the the kind of dragon's teeth or Suravikan line or whatever. So, I imagine, but even though you know Ukraine is still in the news, it's not as big a story as it was every day. And but I think that's going to change again fairly soon. Yeah. So I imagine we'll be sending teams back in. But, you know, I'm just one of trying to think there's four photographers and probably half a dozen journalists that cover the story. So, so can, can you share with us a little bit of those conversations from, you know, from the editorial room to say, you know, should we be going back? You know, no one's really focused, you know, no one cares anymore. I mean, you know, some, you know, something as it relates to, how they're perceiving society in general, you know, we're back, you know, we, we have to cover like you had to uh, Wimbledon, you know, the U S open is coming world cup, you know, whatever it may be, um, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of color around what goes on in the editorial room. Gosh, I mean, I, I don't get to sit in conference as we, as they call it, where, where the sort of big cheeses sit and discuss all of this, but <laughs> I know that, you know, for our paper, I mean, we have a podcast that goes out every day called Ukraine the Latest, and that's five days a week. And that's been going on five days a week since the war started. So they have that every day. And so they they keep they keep the story going. There's probably coverage. We cover the news every day, but sending teams in has reduced and I guess you know there is that thing about about money it's expensive i think we've talked about this before it's it's very expensive and it's i guess it's it's picking when the time is right yeah because mm -hmm. what you don't want to do is everybody has a budget i mean you you could you could talk about the about the u.s government having a budget right they've got a finite amount of money that they can donate to the war effort and we have a finite amount of money that we can donate to covering, not donate, but to to, to cover yeah, stories. Yeah. I mean, I have to be careful. Yeah, you know, I, I can't speak for you know, my my newspaper or whatever. <laughs> There's a lot of caveats with this, but this is you know my my take on it is that you know you have to pick and choose 
when you go, right? right. And I think everybody, some, you know, some papers and TV organizations have just em endless sums of money. I, I, and, and it's amazing that they they can do it. And I think it's great that they're able to to have four teams around the clock covering this. And some of them do, right? I think the New York Times does. Yeah, at least well. three teams just constantly covering it. And it's amazing. And they do a fantastic job. And you've got a lot of freelancers that are there who are, you know, living on their savings and covering the story and, you know, selling to news organizations and just trying to keep this story fresh in people's minds. So we we do have the story in the paper. I mean, there's there's a, you know, on the website, there's a there's a Ukraine tab. So every day they're updating it. But I guess with the digital age, you can do a lot of reporting on a story and have use freelancers and other people and and then just wait until you see you think the moment's right to then send your teams back in when the story's peaking or whatever, you know, I don't know. I mean, that, yeah. that's my that's my take on it. And I, I've just got a feeling that this autumn, they'll, they will, you know, hopefully for the right reasons. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I'm still, you know, deeply concerned. You know, I, I don't, you know, keep hearing stories about, you know, oh, Prigozhin's gone, this is, you know, going to change everything or, you know, the Russian military are disintegrating and, and they're not, you know. This is 18 months in, the, the, the Russian army aren't disintegrating. They're fighting hard. They're pushing back around Kupiansk. They're evacuating Kupiansk now. They might retake Kupiansk. Right. And then what happens? They could then, you know, if they take re they retake Kupiansk and in, get over the river again, then they could then move towards Izium. You know, it's, it's like these ebbs and flows, you know, of a front line. So, you know, Ukraine could push down in the south and then anything could happen i mean let's let's i'm hoping for the best but it's it's just so important to not kind of just assume that this is all gonna end well yeah. i mean i you know it's yeah you know, my heart goes out to everybody that you know there every day it's yeah so tough yeah well um... well I, I mean i hope that this is you know my pictures have helped to illustrate in some way i mean there's no, the, the, fantastic the, the, photographers doing incredible work there every day. Yeah, no, all, all of you are doing yeah the work that we need to see and keep on seeing and um, the humanity of it all. You know that that photograph of that young woman reading Churchill's book, um, you know, is so important just to see the mundaneness of war and the craziness. You know, all within minutes. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, and yeah, and yeah, I, I can't thank you enough for for coming back and showing us again. And you know that um, you know we want you back with you know when you have more work because we really want to keep the um, the light shining on this so that people don't forget. And um, um, you know we keep supporting the Ukrainian people in every way we can. I think. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me again. I'm very humbled that you know. That you've asked me to come back and wanted to see what I've shot again. It's you know it means a lot, and you know I hope that you know by sharing these pictures, it just helps the people get an understanding of what's going on. And yeah, and, and does. so I, I I thank you and and know that you as you know you have a standing invitation anytime to uh, to come back and and you know most importantly when you go back, just be safe. You know, be careful. You know, there's uh, you know your family and you know the rest of your uh, editorial family. You know cares. So we will be in touch. And again, I thank you. Any closing words? It's all yours, Heathcliff. Just um, yeah, just thank you so much for having me. And you know, I just think it's really important that you know if you if you care about what's going on there, just you know just keep going online and and looking up what's happening at the moment. And you know social media and everything it's with the way that data works now those metrics the fact that people you know all of these news organizations they know how many people click on a ukraine story right That's it. so by by keeping that interest up it it makes the people back in you know 
the number crunchers and the editors and stuff they know that people want to know what's going on so it's really you know it's just it's really important that to to support your you know your local you know news gatherers or whatever you know international media and local media and you know because without the support of of the readers then we wouldn't have the money to be able to go out there at all so you know thank you so much yep thank you be safe and we'll be in touch i appreciate it Another another compelling story from another courageous photographer, doing uh, doing really important work. Um, so, yeah, I, I thank you all again for coming in and you know sharing this week. Um, we'll do it again if anyone has any comments or any ideas, and you know what other stories may be of interest that you know we can look into. Uh, photographers covering different angles. You know, we got a good story this week uh, from Tom about volunteerism which was um which was great you know the journeys that he kept on making uh and, and like i said anyone has any other ideas or any other contacts with people you know that we can reach out to i think um maybe before the new year we'll do this once more uh for the, you know another week of this so uh but if not you know good night